Misha here again with everyone's favorite topic again, French guns, French sidearms. And last time we talked about, in probably too much detail, the 35A and the 35S, both in 7.65 long. Now, let's talk about the Mali or PA-1950, which is essentially the same gun as the 35S, although it does have some elements from the A, and upscaled to hold 9 plus 1 rounds of 9 by 19 Parabellum Luger. A lot of the same features. And these are actually pretty uncommon in the USA because these are never sold commercially or really even much for export. These are made for the French to be used by the French. And that's pretty much it. So as always, let's dive into the history. At the end of World War II, France was already very much determined to reclaim its colonies, Algeria, Indochina, and so on. So it would need new small arms. And because they were just starting to adopt 7.65 long, and the new MAS-38 submachine gun and the pistols, 35A and S here. When the Germans came in, everything was just a mess. They had five or six different cartridges in service. So one of the first orders of business, they selected 9 by 19 Parabellum Luger. That was around May of 1945, and there was actually a very, very good reason for that. A gun that I think is criminally underrated, the French Mauser-produced P38, known in French service as the MLE 1938, or just M38, colloquially known as the Grey Ghost. For a long time, these were just not valued, and they are, that's a shame because they're really interesting guns. You see, the Obendorf factory, Mauser, which had been producing the P38 under the Nazis, were using the SVW code. Well, that factory was in the French zone of occupation. And France had lost a lot of guns in World War II, and the factory was there with lots of guns crated up, more parts for guns, and the workers with nothing to do. So right after the war ended in May of 45, they ramped up production there. And they would build between 40 and 50,000 of these P-38s using leftover parts and making some new. Now the earliest ones would have black plastic grips, but soon they would go to these pressed steel grips, which was actually an idea Mauser had to save on uh, material but never put it into production. Well, the French did. And these would have a, a phosphate finish, and they would get a French star proof. And Although production would only last until 1946, at which time the Soviets vehemently objected, they turned out tens of thousands, and it was kind of a de facto standard within the French military, especially the Foreign Legion and other colonial units. Hence, its 9mm cartridge became well-known and stocked and all that. And uh, Grey Ghosts here would turn up a lot in Vietnam. And, yeah, were around in France for a very long time and did help influence trials for a new pistol. First priority was to have a new submachine gun. After that, in 1946, the requirements for a new pistol were announced. And they were extensive. They had a long list. For one thing, it needed to weigh 650 grams, so like 23 ounces. It also effectively needed to fire 9 millimeter. They wanted it to have between a, about a 3.9 and 4.7 inch barrel. They really wanted a 9 shot magazine, so 9 plus 1. They wanted it to be single action only. A lot of the other descriptions very much sound like the 35A and S. You know, the disassembly was specified, the types of sights specified, the, the grip style. They said it needed to be ergonomic and naturally pointing. That, that was specified. Um, even the type of rear sight, the shape was specified. 
Yeah, lots of specified zids. Basically, they knew what they wanted. What they wanted was one of these rechambered for 9mm, like one of these. But they would actually have open trials, and those would begin in uh, 1950. You can tell they weren't in a huge hurry. First, they needed to select the submachine gun. And just for a second here, that is the Mat 49 from, well, the Tula factory. Firing 9 by 19 They had lots of specifications for it, too. Lots of you know, trials were starting in 48, ran through 49. And these would actually be in service for the Korean War, and again, used a lot in Indochina. Cool gun, covered it in the past in videos. Uh, you gotta love folding magwells. But with this submachine gun in service, now the need for a new pistol and to really consolidate and get supply chains going became very important. Plus again, with the Korean War and other events, NATO commonality is uh, very much on their minds. So, trials. Much as it happened 15 years earlier, we had four main competitors. You had two designs from MAS, which were based on the 1935S. You had one design from SACOM, which is based on the 35A. And you had a fourth entry, which was a SIG, well at the time it was a P478. And this wasn't actually submitted by SIG, it was actually a commercially purchased gun that the French did and uh, was put into the trials. And remember, the 210 is based on a patent purchased by SIG from SACOM, so it has very much similar lines to what the SACOM entry would have been. And uh, yeah, they conducted trials. One thing they had to change was the weight requirement. They had to lift that up because a nine shot Nine millimeter pistol is not going to be 23 ounces in 1950. It seems like the SACOM design didn't get very far. Uh, there's not a lot of clarification on the two different MAS designs, but it seems like it really did come down to the MAS design and the 210. In fact, the 210 proved to be the most dependable, reliable, durable, and accurate. But really, since the trials were announced, it was a foregone conclusion they were going to go with the French design, and hence we ended up with the model 1950 here. The MLE 1950, or PA-50, commonly referred to as MAC-50 in the USA. This was designed expressly for the trials, an MAS design, and it was selected in August of 1950, despite it having issues during the trials. There were problems with uh, durability, cracked parts, broken parts, what have you. So despite these problems and the fact that the SIG showed itself very capable, they selected this, and the MAS factory went back and reworked things a bit and resubmitted three improved versions for testing in March of 1951. These went through an 8,500 round endurance test and only broke a couple of firing pins. And they were much, much better, much more improved designs. And so with that, uh, production was set up not at MAS, but actually at the MAC, the Mac factory, because MAS was busy yet again. And the first batches were ready to go in 1953. The 1950 would become the standard all throughout the French military, so the Army, the Air Force, the Marines, the Navy. Also, the National Police, the Gendarmerie, and other police agencies, police reserve. This was not designed for export or commercial sales, and really never was. This was designed for France, to be used by France. And it was designed to replace a host of pistols, and standardize on the 9x19 cartridge. In fact, here, let's take a look at the pistols that were placed in service. Here are some of the guns in service that the new gun was to replace. The five calibers they were using were original 7.65 long, of course, 7.65 by 17, 32, 8mm ordnance, 
revolver, 9 by 19 Parabellum, and even 45 ACP. <laughs> Despite the fact that it was old, there were still plenty of the old 1892 revolvers in France following World War II. Same goes for the Rubies. They had hundreds of thousands of them, and if nothing else, they were simple and dependable, so they were lasting. They also ended up with some FN Model 1922s that were purchased by the French Navy. Others were left behind by the Germans. And they had their own kind of copy and clone of that in the form of the MAB Model D, along with the Model C. I just don't have a C here, although the D was the more militarized version. So those are all around. There's also another gun called the Unique 17 that was another 32. And then moving here, of course, we had 35 A's and S's. We talked about those. And then a lot of German guns were left behind. And the Mauser factory not only produced P-38s, they did make some of the HSCs for France, including phosphating them. And there's even rumors that some Lugers were turned out by Mauser, Obendorf. Either way, there were plenty of Lugers left behind. And it wasn't just Grey Ghost P-38s, but plenty of wartime P-38s were left behind by the Germans. And then finally, there was a number of 1911 A1s in France, thanks to U.S. foreign aid and assistance. It was a mess, like I said, and this isn't even all of them. Yeah, you can't blame the guys for wanting to consolidate. So yeah, standardization is good, and along with the MAT-49, both were standards by the mid-50s. Actually, interestingly, this gun, the 35S, is slightly longer than the 1950. This is like 7.7 .7 inches, this is like 7.75. Just kind of found that funny. This is much taller because of the grip requirement for the 9-round mag. It uses very much the same style of mag as this, though. The weight ended up being about 33 ounces, because that's just what they had to do. We've got Bakelite-style panels, and we have a barrel that's actually about a little under 4.5 inches, about 4.4, so a slightly longer barrel than the 35S. And as far as the details and, and whatnot of construction and features, well, we have the single-action trigger. We have very much the... 35S M1 type safety magazine disconnect. In fact, let's uh, go over and take this apart and talk about the mechanics a bit. This comes apart almost identical to the 35S. All in there. With it held back, you just press out. A little more tension on this one because of uh, being the stronger spring. So I'm just lying there. That's it. This too has the removable trigger pack. Kind of neat from an armorer's point of view. Having this back strap is very Tokarev 1930, TT 30 of them. And looking at our slide, it looks at first to be very much like the 35S. It has the single link and the same style of captive spring. However, it's kind of a hybrid because like the 35A, it has cutouts to lock in to the slide. So the lockup is more like the 35A. I find that a little interesting, that's all. And again, we have a nine round mag, something mandated by the French themselves when they were ordering a new pistol. But let's move on. The older 7.65 long guns would be retired for police use or sold abroad or put into reserve. And that left the 50 and the Grey Ghost P38s, as well as others to kind of march forward into the 1960s. Like I said, they would see much widespread use and uh, constant production. Unfortunately, in 1961, it was known that the state-owned Mack Arsenal 
was going to be shut down. So if they wanted to keep making these, they would have to uh, rework things. It proved to be a durable, simple, solid pistol, if not remarkable. Um, it wasn't known for great accuracy, but it got the job done. Uh, it did have a phosphate finish originally, and that seems to be pretty much all they, how they all were. There were very few changes. It was just the design that worked because it was based on the older ones. I should say that these were done in, at least at the Mac factory in blocks of 10,000 beginning with serial number A and uh, running up through the W block. Uh, Mac would produce just under 222,000 of these by the time their production run was over in 1963 and the factory uh, closed down. It's kind of a transitional process. The same thing would kind of affect the MAT, and production would shift over to, again, the P-38s were long out of production, but were still being issued up until the late 60s when they were surplused out and brought over here by inner arms. And by the 70s, the older guns were also effectively out of service. So that kind of gets us to the latter days. I don't have much to say about the field use. It was just dependable. It worked just fine. And again, France really wasn't trying to export these to anyone. A few were given to colonial governments and close allies, and more were left behind in places like Vietnam and Algeria, and that's how a few ended up in the USA. But it was still going strong into the 70s. With the MAC factory closing in 1963, that could have been the end of the 1950, but it wasn't. There really wasn't much competition within France. There was this gun, MAB's PA-15, which was released in 1966 through 68 in prototype form and on the market by the end of the decade. But for various corporate reasons, this was never a serious threat. Plus, its only real advantage was that it held 15 rounds instead of nine in the magazine, still it was a single action. It's a very heavy gun. That's the only real advancement in handgun tech within France, and it came really too late to challenge and wasn't enough of an improvement to really warrant switching over. So, in 1961, the process began to transfer the production line from MAC to MAS, which is kind of ironic because the reverse happened in 1944-45, with the 35S, and of course the design was originally from MAS, it's just Mac produced it. They built their first frames in October of that year, and so between 62 and 63, they began making more parts and transferring the technology over. And so by 1964, MAS was up running in full, building these, and they would keep building them until about 1978. Now they would change up the serial formatting. Instead of having uh, four-digit serials, with prefixes, they would have five digits, and they would start over with A, well not A, excuse me, they, they would start their new series with the prefix FG, run up to 100,000, and then start a new range with FH prefixes, but they only built about 20,000 there. So MAS built about 120,000, and uh, MAC had built, like I said, is actually 221,900,000, nine bringing total production up to 341,900. So, yeah, quite a bit bigger number than the 83 and 85,000 for the previous uh, S and A models. And it served for a very long time. In fact, this was still standard issue as we moved in to the 1990s. But at that time, it really was starting to show its age. After testing in the late 80s, the Beretta 92G was adopted, the G being the version with the decocker only safety, to replace the 1950. And it was produced under license in France as the PEMAS G1. So after the Gulf War period, they started to ramp up productions of pistols like these. And so they started to phase these out. However, plenty of secondary units and some overseas units and what have you would keep the 1950, but the frontliners would get the G1. Kind of an interesting side note, in, in around 2000, 
Some G1s were observed with cracks in their slides, so some 1950s were brought back out of storage and put into frontline use temporarily. But as Afghanistan and Iraq would move on, the whole war on terror phase, newer guns would, uh, would come in. For example, some units within France would issue the Glock, either 17 or 19. I just brought up my 19 Gen 2, but others, others have been used. And there would be some HKs, for example, the USP and the USB Compact, the French Navy like those. And there would be some SIGs like the P, uh, excuse me, SP2022 uh, used by certain units and police departments. Again, we're kind of breaking it up a bit, although the G1 was still the standard, at least on paper, for a long time. But this allowed the 1950s, which you know are getting quite old at this point, to finally get retired out. Although it has to be said, it's a credit to their durability that they proved to actually be more durable and reliable than some of the much newer G1s and held on until high capacity was just too much to ignore. Plus, you know, modern safety features. Some are still uh, kind of knocking about in very second, third line reserve units today in France. Most are in storage. They never have been sold off as surplus, much less sold off as surplus here in the USA. It's a shame because it's actually a pretty neat old gun. It's just a shame that it's so rare here. As with the first video, I greatly appreciate you hanging out. And I hope maybe this was a more interesting gun because you just don't see much with the 30, uh, the 1950. You see the 35 ANS a good bit. It is more comfortable than the uh, 35 S. This has, of course, this very straight, very kind of trapezoidal grip shape. The 35A has the Charles Petter type curvy, and that is another element that is carried over to the 50. They do give it much more of a curvy ergonomic grip, but it is very long top to bottom because of them wanting the 9 round magazine. It's very heavy too, very steel, very chunky. That's not a bad thing though for a 1950s gun. I do like these old school Bakelite grips though. Those are just cool. <laughs> but um, Yep, magazine disconnects to works on this one. And trigger is good and it has that rebounding hammer style from the S safety and all that good stuff. Not what I'd consider the best or most trustworthy safety system, but it is very simple. Give it that. And in some areas, these are still in service today within the French authority. But most of them are out now. I don't know why I felt like talking about these pistols. I just did, so thought I'd bring you along for the journey. I do hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you could, please do like, share, and subscribe. And if you'd like to help support the channel, you know, you can always check out the link to the Patreon page. This is Nisha. Catch you very soon next time.